It all started with George's absolutely fantastic idea. He and I were members of a small interdepartmental committee that met weekly to discuss the secrecy of planned military operations. We exchanged information from a variety of sources, from our own services and other agencies in England, from neutral countries, and from intelligence reports from intelligence officers in enemy countries. Having, in addition, the latest information about the intentions of the Allies, we had to prevent the leakage of military secrets and anticipate the actions of enemy intelligence. This is not an easy task, but the committee was well chosen. It consisted not only of knowledgeable and experienced career officers, but also of reserve officers and civilians working in a wide variety of fields. It was a mixed bunch, but we could expertly review any data and from any perspective. Together we had a wide range of knowledge, and there were not many fields of endeavour with which any one of us was not involved. George came up with the idea while discussing a report from Occupied Europe. We were trying, as always, to find out whether it was a genuine document or whether it had been fabricated and slipped to the Allies by the Germans. George had an extremely inventive mind, and usually his fantastic and ingenious proposals were so complicated that they could not be realised. But sometimes his ideas were absolutely brilliant in their simplicity. While we were pondering whether the message was genuine, or whether the Germans had managed to capture our agent and send a report in his name, George recalled a recent order which forbade our officers carrying secret documents from using aircraft if they could be shot down over enemy territory. Having spoken of this, George suddenly suggested that in order to verify the authenticity of such reports, we should somehow get the Germans to tell us something deliberately false, and thus find out how they operate. If we drop a radio to the resistance in France, George said, and it starts working, it is difficult to tell whether it is the Germans or a friendly Frenchman who is transmitting the messages. But if the radio is dropped with a dead body attached to a half-opened parachute, the task of checking is made easier. The Frenchman will undoubtedly inform us of what has happened, while the Germans will conceal it and use the transceiver as if our agent were alive. Of course, such a stunt may not succeed, but the whole staging will not require much effort, and honestly, it's worth a try. Listen, do any of you know where we can get a dead body? He asked in conclusion. It wasn't his best fiction, and we quickly broke George down. Agents don't codes and other materials necessary for transmissions. Hence, how would the Germans be able to conduct transmissions? Next, when the parachute fails, the cargo undoubtedly hits the ground hard, so the corpse must necessarily have broken limbs, must have bruises and scratches. And it is quite easy to ascertain when the injuries were inflicted, whether before or after death. So whoever finds the body will very soon realize that the parachutist died before he even hit the ground. Then, even if we retrieve the body, it must be the body of a person who died in a fall from a height. This last point made it incredibly difficult. No, George's proposal had clearly failed. So we went back to our report from France. Was it genuine or not? A few months later, however, this fantastic idea bore fruit. In the early summer of 1942, our committee was busy with its first big job. Operation Torch, the invasion of North Africa, was being prepared, and the experience we had previously gained in keeping small-scale operations secret was now being fully tested. We realized that it was impossible to hide from the enemy that an operation was being planned. Firstly, it was clear to everyone that the Allies will not sit idle because somewhere the invasion must begin. Secondly, you can't keep out foreign diplomats. They travelled all over the country meeting and talking not only with persons privy to our plans, but also with those people who could not fail to see the accumulation of ships or troops before departure. And whatever the official viewpoint, our committee had no illusions as to the neutrality of individual members of the diplomatic corps. Besides, even a pro-English diplomat has to do his job. He has a duty to report to his government all that is happening here in England, and when this report reaches his country, there is no doubt that there is at least one official or minister there who has already been bribed or at least ideologically prepared to pass the information to the Germans. Thirdly, there are neutral businessmen and sailors who make regular voyages between England and the continent. 
Therefore, we could not hope to conceal from the Germans the fact of preparation of the operation. But we were able to hide the most important thing, when and where it begins. Before the invasion of North Africa, the Allies were not bound, and they could strike anywhere. The Germans were entitled to think that we could land in Norway, Holland or France, try to launch an offensive through Spain seize the Canary Islands or the Azores to facilitate the fight against submarines, land in Libya and strike at the army of Rommel from the rear, except for Egypt. We were free to choose the direction of the strike and could land anywhere in German-occupied Europe, in any neutral country. Under such conditions, our committee was required to conceal from the enemy the object of the strike and the date of the start of the operation. This meant that we had to organize the lead of false information about the allegedly planned objects of action, and support this information with some document, say an application for tropical helmets for some of our units, when in fact they would be preparing to land, for example, on the Lofoten Islands. Alongside this we had to take all measures to prevent, as far as possible, the leakage of genuinely secret information which inevitably leaked out of England. In other words, it was necessary to ensure that the intentions of the Allies were kept secret, and at the same time to ensure that the leakage that could still occur, despite the precautions taken, did not give away our true intentions. When Operation Torch was being prepared, we did exactly that. And as we studied the reports of our intelligence, learning about the steps taken by the Germans, we were convinced that the measures we took justified themselves. The enemy did not know where we would strike. However, after Operation Torch, the problems we were to face were quite different. At this stage of the war in the hands of the Allies in the entire North African coast, and they were preparing to strike in the soft underbelly of Europe, to use Churchill's expression. Our committee was all the time aware of the strategic plans of the British and American staffs, and it had a role to play when the offensive began. It was quite obvious that the Allies, having mastered the entire North African coast, will not transport troops to England for the invasion of Europe across the English Channel, and that at least some of these troops will be used to land in southern Europe, in Italy, Greece or France. Either of these operations seemed possible, and our committee had to prepare to act in accordance with the final decision of the command. We might have done well working according to the method which had so far produced such good results. But the strategic situation was characterized by one peculiarity, which created a new problem. Sicily, that football on the toe of the Italian boot is in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. This meant that unless we took possession of it, our convoys in the Mediterranean would suffer enormous losses, even when the airfields in North Africa finally came into our hands. We realized that before launching a new operation in the Mediterranean basin, the Allies would have to capture Sicily. Our committee always began work well in advance of the operation, and we discussed a plan of action to ensure the secrecy of the strike on Sicily even before the beginning of Operation Torch. We foresaw the difficulties. After all, if it was clear to us that after North Africa on the turn of the day will be Sicily, the Germans understood this. How to prevent the enemy to strengthen the defense of Sicily, if he will try to do it for the same strategic reasons that make the Allies prepare for the capture of the island. In discussing this problem, we were reminded of George's fantastic idea. What if we get a dead body? I suggested dress it in the uniform of a staff officer and provide important documents, which would indicate that we are going to land not in Sicily and elsewhere. We wouldn't have to dump the body on the ground, as the aeroplane could be shot down over the sea on the way to Africa. The corpse with the documents will be washed up on the coast of France or in Spain. There the Germans will be more difficult to make a detailed examination of the body, and at the same time from Spain they will certainly get the documents or at least copies of them. Excited, we weighed all the possibilities of this plan. There were a number of details to be clarified what condition the corpse should be in after an aeroplane crash over the sea, what is usually the cause of death in such cases, what might be found at the autopsy of the body, whether a suitable body could be obtained. These were the questions which demanded answers in the first place. If the answers were satisfactory, the plan deserved to be taken up. 
none of us doubted that the Spaniards, if only given the opportunity, would play their intended part, and then what prospects would open up before us. We were confident that we would get the body and at the same time we were well aware of the difficulties that awaited us here. However, we did not realize how difficult it would actually be, frankly speaking. We did not start searching for the corpse without any special willingness, because even in the ruthless time of war, the natural feeling of respect for a dead person does not diminish, but this feeling was overcome by the thought of how many lives could be saved, by using for the intended purpose a body which we knew it, would eventually be buried with honours. The difficulty we immediately encountered was the preservation of secrecy. After all, we could not go to the relatives of the deceased in their hour of grief, and without any explanation ask permission to take the remains of the son, husband or brother they were mourning, and if they demand an explanation, what do we tell them? There are characters in novels who are willing to give up the body of their only just dead relative without asking why they are taking it, but that's in a novel but in life. First we had to establish exactly what kind of corpse we needed. If the Germans, according to our plan, should take him as a victim of an aeroplane crash over the sea, then we must find such a body which would have no signs of death from other causes. It seemed to me that this question should be approached from the point of view of the person who would perform the autopsy. What could a pathologist anatomist expect to find when opening a corpse nailed to the shore after the aeroplane carrying the deceased had fallen into the sea? I immediately thought of Bernard Spilsbury. He was a very experienced pathologist, and besides I was sure that he would keep the secret entrusted to him. In this sense there was no difference between Sir Bernard and the oyster. Spilsbury also possessed another, rarer quality. I firmly knew that he would not ask a single question except those, the answers to which he needed for the solution of the problem put to him. Spilsbury would simply take note of the fact that we wanted the floating body to be mistaken for a victim of an aeroplane crash, and would not inquire into the details. I rang Spilsbury and we arranged to meet at the Junior Carlton Club. There, over a shot of sherry, I told him about my case. After a moment's deliberation he gave me one of those concise and complete interpretations which have more than once convinced juries and even judges. His advice gave me hope. If we put a life jacket on the body we can use the corpse of a person who has either drowned or died of almost any natural cause. Stims of aircraft crashes over the sea die from injuries sustained when the aircraft hit the water drown or die simply from lack of help at sea. There are also cases of shock, so the field of our search was narrowing. My opinion of Bernard Spilsbury was fully justified. This remarkable man answered questions without for a moment giving vent to his curiosity, which he must have felt after all. He asked me several questions relating to the pathological problem I had put to him, but never once asked me why I was interested in all this. Now we were to make enquiries about recently deceased people. We could not do it openly. Under all circumstances we had to avoid anything that might provoke conversations like, you haven't heard. It's very strange. Someone asked someone the other day where to get a body. We started to search with extreme caution. All in all it looked almost like Pirandello's six officers in search of a corpse. At one time we were seriously considering that we would have to steal the corpse from the cemetery, but as long as we had other ways, we wanted to try them out. We were able to make some inquiries with military doctors we could trust, but as soon as there was an opportunity to get a corpse, it turned out that either the relatives did not give their consent, or we could not trust the people who would probably give us the corpse of their loved one. Often we were not satisfied with the cause of death. Finally, when we had only to either turn to the morgues or to expand the circle of persons initiated into the mystery, we heard about a man who had just died of pneumonia after a long stay in the cold. Pathologically, the corpse seemed to fulfill our requirements. With feverish speed we began to make inquiries about the deceased's background and family situation. We made sure that the relatives would keep secret the minimum of information that would have to be given to them. We could say that the purpose was truly honourable and that the remains would be given a decent burial, albeit under an assumed name. So
The consent for which we are to this day extremely grateful was obtained on condition that no one would ever know the surname of the deceased. I will therefore say here only one thing. It was the body of a man of about thirty or so years of age. Out of precaution I once more consulted Bernard Spilsbury. He was quite satisfied that inflammation of the lungs suited the case, for in this disease a certain amount of fluid accumulates in the lungs, as when a man dies in the waves of the sea. The pathologist anatomist, knowingly assuming a drowned man, is unlikely to discover at the autopsy the difference between the fluid in the lungs and the seawater. Spilsbury ended our conversation with his characteristically confident statement. You have nothing to fear from an autopsy in Spain. Only a pathologist anatomist with my experience will be able to find that this young man did not drown, and there is no such thing in Spain. We had arranged for the body to be stored in a suitable refrigerator until we were ready to use it. Now we had to get approval from our superiors. First of all, the operation had to be given a tentative name. With the exception of the names of major operations, which were invented by the Prime Minister himself, all names were taken from lists compiled for the various headquarters. I found out what names were on the Admiralty list. There I found the word Minsmith. It had been restored to the lists recently, after its use in one successful operation. By this time my humour had become somewhat grim, and I decided that the word was appropriate, so the operation was called Minsmith. Then it had to be decided where to send the body. After weighing up the pros and cons, I finally chose the town of Huelva in Spain. In Huelva, as we knew, was active German agent who had close contact with Spanish officials and others. If the body reached Huelva, all the odds were in favour of the papers and belongings of the deceased reaching the agent. Even if circumstances prevented this, he would be able to obtain copies of the documents or get detailed information about them and would certainly alert his superiors in Madrid, who would endeavour to intercept the documents at a higher authority. The only risk was that the body and the documents could be immediately handed over to the British vice-consul in Huelva. In that case, the German agent would have learnt exactly nothing, but the Spaniards and Germans cooperated so closely that legal action was unlikely, and if there was a Spaniard who wanted to act in accordance with existing laws, I was sure that several others would certainly prevent him. Another advantage of our choice was that the town of Huelva was not too near Gibraltar. We did not want the Spaniards to send the body there. It's the appearance in Gibraltar of the corpse of an officer, who did not really exist, might have caused talk, which would undoubtedly have reached the numerous German agents who received information from Spaniards visiting Gibraltar. At the Admiralty, with the chief hydrographer of the Navy, I made inquiries as to the weather and tides at various points on the Spanish coast at all seasons of the year. Luck did not change us here either. Although the tidal currents here run along the coast, in April a southwesterly wind prevails in this neighbourhood, and the chief hydrographer thought that the object would in all probability drift towards the shore, and a body in a life jacket is more exposed to the wind than the object I spoke to the hydrographer about. Chuelva, then. We had no doubt that the body would be washed ashore and subsequently handed over to the British vice-consul for burial. We were also sure that the German agent would deliver all the papers, or at least copies of them, to the high command of the German armed. Looking ahead, let us say that he justified our trust. Now we had to think about the means of transport. If you drop the body from the plane, it hitting the surface of the water, it will be damaged. So there were three ways to lower the corpse into the sea. Submarine, flying boat or one of the ships that accompanied our transports travelling along the Spanish coast. We chose the submarine because it could get close to the coast without risk of being seen. And I sought permission from the Deputy Chief of Naval Staff to discuss the matter with Admiral Barry, the commander of our submarine forces. Permission was granted. Admiral Barry appreciated our idea and referred me to his Chief of Staff. The latter said that the stuffing could be transported on one of the submarines that travelled more or less regularly to the island of Malta. These boats delivered important, though not too bulky, items to the island. Despite the size of the container, about 200 centimetres in length and about 60 centimetres in diameter, 
the chief of staff felt that it could be placed inside the solid hull of the submarine and lifted up for launching through the fighting deckhouse. This made our task much easier, as we could dispense with a lightweight hermetically sealed container instead of a heavy and complicated device that would have to withstand the pressure of seawater when the submarine was submerged. So the question remained as to whether the body could be placed in a simple container or whether a kind of large thermos would have to be constructed. I once again consulted Bernard Spilsbury. In his opinion, temperature is of comparatively little importance here if the body is frozen before being placed in the container. It was important to get rid of oxygen in the container, for oxygen would favor decomposition. Spilsbury advised to place the container upright and fill it with dry ice. Then the body is carefully lowered into the container, put around the dry ice and then the container is closed. There would be so little oxygen left in the container that if the body was picked up soon after it was lowered into the water, it would be in exactly the same condition as if it had been in the water for several days. We ordered a container made of two layers of sheet steel with asbestos lining. It was closed with a lid which had a waterproof rubber gasket and was screwed on with 16 bolts. A spanner was attached to the lid by a chain. There were handles on the bottom and lid of the container. As together with the body, the container weighed about 150 kilograms. Some time later I met with Admiral Barry again. I reported that the plan was progressing and if approved, we would like to carry it out around the end of April. That is, during the new moon when the possibility of detecting a submarine close to shore is the least. The Admiral decided to place the submarine Seraph at our disposal, as her departure for Melta could be delayed by a fortnight. The choice was all the more fortunate, because this submarine was commanded by Lieutenant Jewell, and he and his crew had already had experience in special operations related to the landing of troops in North Africa. They were the ones who helped General Gerard escape from captivity and took General Clark to North Africa, from where he was to secretly contact the resistance forces in France. They also took him back. I drafted a combat order to the submarine commander, and Admiral Barry approved it. At his suggestion, Lieutenant Jewell came to the headquarters of the submarine force, and we discussed all the details of the upcoming operation without interference. I then handed him a combat order which read as follows. Operation Minsmith. One objective. To ensure the delivery of the briefcase with the documents ashore, as close to Huelva as possible do it, in such a way that it would appear as if the briefcase was in an aeroplane that had fallen into the sea and was being carried by an officer from England to the Allied headquarters in North Africa. 2. Method A dead body, dressed in the field uniform of a major in the British Marines and a life jacket, together with the briefcase and a rubber dinghy, is taken to the coast of Spain by submarine. The body, fully prepared for launching, will be placed in an airtight container labelled Handle with Care, Optical Instruments, Special Dispatch. The container is about 200 centimetres long and about 60 centimetres in diameter, without any projections on the sides. It is closed on one side with a lid, which is bolted tightly shut. A spanner is attached to it by a chain. Both the lid and the bottom have handles. The container can be lifted by both handles or by using only the handle on the lid, but it is undesirable to lift the container by one handle as the steel of which it is made is very thin. The total weight of the container is about 150 kilograms. The body in the container is surrounded by a layer of dry ice, so the container should be opened on deck and not inside the submarine, as dry ice releases carbon dioxide. 3. Location The body should be launched as close to shore as possible, and as close as possible to the town of Huelva, preferably northwest of the river mouth. According to the Hydrographic Office, the currents in the area are mainly along the coast, so the time for launching the body should be chosen when the wind is blowing towards the coast. At this time of year, southwesterly winds prevail in the area. The latest information regarding tidal currents in the area, obtained from the Chief of Hydrographic Department, is at for delivery of cargo. 
ships, the cargo will be delivered to the port of departure by land at any laziness specified, preferably as close as possible to the day of departure. The briefcase will be handed over to the submarine commander at the same time. The rubber boat is in a separate package. 5. Descending the body. Having removed the body from the container, the chain attached to the handle of the briefcase should be fastened to the waistband of the overcoat in which the corpse is dressed. This chain is exactly the same as the one usually worn under the overcoat on the chest, and the free end is released through the sleeve. At one end of the chain, there is a carabiner clasp to attach it to the handle of the briefcase, and at the other end, there is the same clasp which fastens on the chest. It is this end of the chain that should be fastened to the waistband of the overcoat, as if the officer, while in the aeroplane, had removed the chain for reasons of convenience, but still left it attached to the waistband, so as not to forget the briefcase or drop it in the aeroplane. The body as well as the rubber boat should then be lowered into the water. Since the rubber boat will float at a different speed than the body, the place of launching the boat relative to the body is not important, but it should not be too close to the body. 6. Informed persons in Gibraltar. Steps have been taken to inform the chief of the garrison at Gibraltar and the chief of intelligence at his headquarters of the intended operation. Apart from them, no one in Gibraltar is aware of the operation. 7. Signals. If the operation is successful, it is necessary to report. Minsmith is over. If the report is to be sent from Gibraltar, the Chief of Intelligence should be warned to address it to the Chief of Admiralty Intelligence. If the report can be sent earlier, it will be forwarded in the manner prescribed by the Submarine Force Commander's respective orders. 8. Cancellation. If the operation has to be cancelled, the order cancel Minsmith will be given. In this case, the body and container should be sunk in deep water. As the container may have positive buoyancy, it should either be loaded with something or filled with water. In the latter case, care should be taken to ensure that the body remains in the container. The briefcase should be handed over to the Chief of Intelligence in Gibraltar, with instructions to burn it without opening it. The rubber boat to be handed over for destruction also to the Chief of Intelligence. 9. Impossibility of the operation? If the operation proves impossible, it should be reported, and as soon as possible, Min Smith failed at 10. Disguise? Prior to the operation, the inscription optical instruments on the container will serve as sufficient camouflage. After the operation has been carried out, the submarine crew can be informed that our aim is to expose a very active German agent in Huelva, and that through the operation data will be obtained which will force the Spaniards to expel the agent from the country. At the same time it is necessary to impress upon the crew that any leak of information, whenever it occurs, may deprive us of the possibility of forcing the Spaniards to do what is to our advantage. The crew must not subsequently be interested in the results achieved, as the operation requires complete secrecy, or the Spaniards will unravel our plan. In fact, the most important thing is that the Germans and Spaniards treat the documents as provided for in paragraph. If they suspect that the documents are forged, there will be serious consequences. I, Montague, Lieutenant Commander. It was now up to us to decide which document to put in the briefcase to make the Germans change their plans and troop dispositions, and by what convincing details to give the document the appearance of being genuine. If the purpose of the operation was to deceive the Germans by forcing them to act in accordance with the contents of the planted document, it had to be an important document. Here you cannot play on the talkativeness of a middle-ranking officer, even the disclosure of official secrets by a brigadier general or a rear admiral in his correspondence with another person of equal rank would not make the proper impression. If it is necessary to convince the German general staff that the object of our next strike will not be Sicily, then it is necessary to present him with a document such as those that are sent to each other people who really know our true plans and who cannot be mistaken or be involved in a diversionary operation. The Germans must know the sender and addressee well, and above all, be sure that these persons are fully aware of the strategic designs of the Allied command.
I suggested that the letter should be written by General Sir Archibald Nye, Deputy Chief of the Imperial General Staff, to General Alexander, Commander of the Army in Tunisia. The address was the headquarters of the 18th Army Group. The letter should have been written something like this. Listen, old chap, I want you to know how well we understand your predicament, but we have our own problems. The Chief of the Imperial General Staff has been forced to reject some of your demands, even though you insist on them. There are very important reasons why we cannot honor your requests right now. Here they are. In other words, in this friendly letter, we have decided to include information and explanations that cannot be inserted in official papers. Such a letter, and only such a letter, theory, could convince the Germans that our next object would not be Sicily, and it could only be found in the dead officer's briefcase, not in a packet of the usual official documents sent to our armies abroad. Our aim was very far away so it was to be expected that we would encounter many difficulties on the way to realizing the idea, for many even very capable and competent people could not understand what our operation required. This requires a very special approach, special think. One and the same task must be able to consider simultaneously from different points of view. You're an English counterintelligence officer. In German intelligence in Berlin, there is a person in the same position. It does not matter what conclusions you, an Englishman with your English mind and character, draw from the document. It matters what conclusions that person draws. It matters how the German counterintelligence officer will understand the document. Therefore, if you want him to come to a certain conclusion, you must give him information that will make him come to that conclusion. But he may turn out to be suspicious and want corroboration. You must anticipate what enquiries he will make and give him answers that will satisfy him. In other words, you must remember that the German thinks and reacts differently from you, and for a while force yourself to think in his terms. But you must not forget the German high command either. If your plan succeeds, the enemy counterintelligence officer will convince him of the validity of your conclusions that you have imposed on him. The German high command is not aware of all the difficulties of the Allies. For example, it does not know that we are short of landing craft, and so it may believe that a certain operation is possible, although your command knows perfectly well that it is ruled out. Your plan should deceive the German headquarters, not the English. However, not everyone understands such reasoning, much less puts it into practice. So, we have encountered difficulties. But before we go to them, I will say a few words about diversionary objects and diversionary operations. If you want to prevent the concentration of enemy forces in the area of the planned landing, you must try to divert these forces to some other area. You must convince the enemy that you intend to attack not your actual objective, but some other, so-called diversionary one. As I have already mentioned, it is impossible to completely conceal from the enemy the preparation for the operation. Therefore, taking measures to prevent leakage of information about the preparation of the operation, it is necessary to organize disinformation of the enemy. For example, if we organize a leak of information about the issue of tropical helmets to the troops, when we are preparing to land on the Lofoten Islands, such a leak will make the enemy conclude that the object of our planned operation is somewhere in the tropics. And if, in addition, to inform the enemy that the captains of the transports intended for the transport of troops in this operation received maps or some information directly indicating the object of the operation, the German intelligence will paint a picture that suits us. The best diversionary object is one that is so far away from the actual object that any defensive measures taken by the enemy at sea, in the air or on land could not contribute to strengthening the defense of the actual object of the operation. So to give a somewhat abstract example, if you intending to invade North Africa were able to convince the enemy that you intended to land in Norway, then any measures the enemy would take to strengthen the defenses of Norway would not prevent the invasion of North Africa. In reality, however, the diversionary object is usually in the same area as the actual object, and so you cannot negate all enemy defensive efforts. For example, if during the landings in North Africa in 1942, 
We had managed to convince the Germans that we intended to strike at Rommel's rear. For example, in the Tobruk area, we would have been able to draw some of the enemy's ground troops and possibly his air force to that area, but the German submarines would still be pulled to the Strait of Gibraltar, through which our convoys had to get through to carry out the actual operation. It was therefore usually necessary to compromise, and instead of an us diversionary object, to choose one in which the enemy could be led to believe. Slinking this theory to the problem facing our group, it should be said that our task was to convince the Germans that the Allies were not going to strike Sicily at the moment, to force them to redeploy their troops elsewhere and spend time and effort to strengthen the defences of another. Looking at the situation from the point of view of the Allied command, we saw that the Allies had at their disposal two armies that occupied the entire North African coast, which were intended to be used in a single operation. This decision was taken for a number of reasons, and it is unnecessary to recount them in detail here. Summarizing the reasons, we can say that the landing on the heavily fortified coast of Sicily, with the subsequent rush to the Apennine Peninsula, required the concentration of all Allied forces. To conduct two operations at the same time we lacked ground troops and aviation. As for transport ships and guard ships, they were not enough even for satisfactory logistical support for one operation. When we looked at the same situation from the German point of view, a somewhat different picture appeared before us. As far as the Germans knew, the Allies could use General Eisenhower's army to strike in southern France, although this would probably necessitate the capture of Sicily. Sardinia, Corsica and generally be a risky operation, since Italy would remain in enemy hands and serve as a base for a counterattack to the rear of the Allied forces, which would then be cut off from sources of supply. Equally, the Germans believed Eisenhower's army could be used to strike Italy, but then the Allies would have to capture Sicily as a first step. Finally, Field Marshal Wilson's army, from the German point of view, could be used to invade Greece and advance into Europe through the Balkans. We had no reason to think that the Germans were aware of the shortage of landing craft, and we were entitled to assume that they could be led to believe that we would launch two simultaneous operations, one in the Western Mediterranean by General Eisenhower's army, and one in the Eastern Mediterranean by Field Marshal Wilson's army. When our group considered the possibilities of Operation Minsmith, from the point of view of misleading the enemy, we reasoned as follows. Since most of the Allied forces are in Tunisia, it is hopeless to try to convince the Germans that we dare to send convoys of troops through a narrow strait past their airfields in Sicily and the eastern Mediterranean. Therefore, the diversionary object must be somewhere west of Italy. Sardinia had already been chosen as such an object in the plan of operation against Sicily. It was decided to convince the Germans that the Allies were going to pass by Sicily and seize Sardinia and Corsica to open the whole Italian coast and southern France for invasion. But I believed that since we were not relying on a series of leaks that might not reach the Germans, but were using a single document, our bow might have a second bowstring. I hoped to convince the Germans that Wilson's army will not take part in the operation against Sardinia but will land in Greece and launch an offensive in the Balkans, and if we succeeded in convincing them of this, we would achieve a greater dispersion of the enemy's forces than if we had built our deception on only one distracting object, Sardinia. It was my suggestion, therefore, that the letter to General Alexander should hint at the preparation of two operations under General Eisenhower against Sardinia and possibly Corsica, and under Field Marshal Wilson against Greece. I suggested also that it would appear from the letter as if we intended to convince the Germans that we were about to launch an invasion of Sicily. The beauty of this suggestion was that if we did not avoid leaking our actual plans, the Germans would treat it as elements of our diversionary operation, which they would learn about from the letter to Alexander. Having swallowed our bait, this is the only letter, they will not believe any true information that leaks out to them. In this form our proposal was presented to the Committee of Chiefs of Staff, and that's when the trouble began. Few people got a chance to see our proposal because we had bypassed the usual channels. And yet, while the plan and the original draft of the document reached the Chiefs of Staff and came back to us, it was peppered with many different counsels and objections.
Everyone who thought he knew how German thought worked came up with all sorts of brilliant ideas. It is, they said, to bet on such writing. It should be on a lower level. It should simply state the wrong date. We will not convince the Germans and will only draw their attention to Sicily. We must not mention Sardinia as an actual object, for if the Germans discover our deception, it will point them directly to Sicily. Perhaps the most difficult part of our operation was to convince my command that such an opportunity would never present itself again, and that if we were to achieve our objective we must aim high. Now looking back, I see that it was easier to deceive the German high command than to convince the British in the success of Operation Minsmith. Fortunately, our plan was interested in Archibald Nye himself. He wrote a letter based on my project which he considered quite realistic. After reading it I could not but admit that, although the diversionary object was very well indicated, the letter as a whole was unconvincing and too straightforward. Such a letter could only have been sent by official post, and not handed to an officer to carry it simply in his pocket. Sir Archibald accepted my challenge and wrote another, truly magnificent letter, just in case the Germans had heard of Operation Husky. He used the word Husky as a code name for the operation against Greece, and the false code name Brimston for the false operation against southern France. This is what the draft of his letter looked like. Telti Poor, Might Hall 9400, War Ministry, Chief of the Imperial General Staff, 23 April, 1943, Personal and Top Secret, Whitehall, London, Sebwe 1. Dear Alex, I take this opportunity to send you a personal letter with one of Mountbatten's officers. I wish to give you some details of a recent exchange of telegrams regarding operations in the Mediterranean theatre and the accompanying supporting actions. You may think that our decisions are somewhat arbitrary, but I hasten to assure you that the Chiefs of Staff Committee has given the most careful consideration to both your recommendations and those of Jumbo. We have recently received information that the Botches are strengthening their defences in Greece and Crete, and the Chief of the Imperial General Staff feels that our forces are insufficient for an offensive. The Committee of Chiefs of Staff decided to reinforce the 5th Division with one brigade to land south of Cape Killini and send the same reinforcement to the 56th Division in Calak. We are now seeking the necessary forces and time. Jumbo Wilson suggested Sicily as a diversionary target for Operation Husky, but we have already selected it for the same role in Operation Brimston. The Chiefs of Staff Committee has reviewed the matter very carefully and has concluded that because of the preparations in Algeria and the landing exercises that will take place on the coast of Tunisia, as well as the massive use of aircraft to neutralize Sicilian airfields, we must stick to our plan that Sicily will be a diversionary target for Operation Brimston. In fact, we have a very good chance to make the Bosch believe that we are targeting Sicily. It is an obvious object, and about it they are surely restless. On the other hand, the chiefs of staff realize that there is little hope of convincing the Bosches that the extensive preparations being made in the eastern Mediterranean also have something to do with Sicily. For this reason they told Wilson that his diversionary object should be nearer the actual one, such as the Dodecanes. Since our relations with Turkey have improved, the Italians should be concerned about these islands. I think you will agree with these arguments. I know you are very busy at the moment and can hardly discuss future operations with Eisenhower, but if you intend to support Wilson's proposal, you will let us know immediately as we cannot wait long. I regret very much that we were unable to fulfill your request for a new commander of the Guards Brigade. Your candidate has been seriously ill with influenza and will not be in shape for several weeks. But you must know Foster well. He's done well for himself commanding a brigade here in the metropolis, and I think he's the right man for the job. You, like us, are probably as tired of all this business about battle honors and purple hearts. We all agree with you that we should not offend our American friends, but there is more to it than that. If our soldiers who happen to be in some theater of war get an extra award simply because Americans are fighting there, we will face more resentment among those troops fighting somewhere else, by perhaps even more stress. It seems to me that we should thank the Americans for their kind offers, 
but say firmly that this will cause too much discontent, and we unfortunately cannot go to meet them here. However, this matter is on the agenda of the next meeting of the parliamentary representatives of the military departments, and I hope you will soon learn of the decision taken. I wish you success. Yours always, Archie Nye, General Sir Harold Alexander, 18th Army Group Headquarters. It could not have been better. Sir Archibald Nye carried out his task as only a man well-versed in the nature of personal relationships between senior officers could do. In passing, so that the Germans do not suspect deception, he makes it clear that there will be an operation in the eastern Mediterranean, with a landing in Greece, and that we want to make the Germans believe that our strike in the western Mediterranean aimed at Sicily. The questions of a personal nature which are raised in the letter are very convincing, proving why it could not have been sent with the official mail. In my opinion, only two points were missed. The first was that the object we allegedly intended to strike in the Western Mediterranean was not named, but the Chiefs of Staff Committee refused to authorize any mention of Sardinia. In its opinion, it would point too clearly to Sicily if the Germans realized our deception. However, when the Prime Minister took a quite realistic view of the whole situation, I managed to insert a humorous reference to Sardinia in another letter which we had prepared on behalf of Lord Louis Mountbatten, and which, we shall see further on, was of considerable value. The second point is less serious. I wanted to include in the letter some detail which would fit the German's thinking, would answer the thoughts which he had already had. A man of average intelligence, I thought would be more likely to believe in the authenticity of a document if it contained something he already knew. In my opinion, the best and most harmless thing to do was to include in the letter a joke on General Montgomery on the level of heavy-handed German humour. I suggested that Sir Archibald quizzed General Alexander, what has happened to Monty. It is now a week since he issued a single... It was not long before General Montgomery had issued a whole series of orders for the purpose of inspiring the troops, by which he had aroused rather malicious ridicule in various quarters. For reasons I have never been able to understand, however, the Committee of Chiefs of Staff flatly forbade the joke. Admittedly, it was silly and the refusal to do so was irrelevant, but I am sure the Germans would have appreciated it. Sir Archibald's letter was printed on his letterhead. The address dear Alex and his signature were put by himself, and the letter was enclosed in a plain double envelope. So the important letter was ready. While preparing the document, which we called an important letter, we also thought a lot about the person who would carry it. After all, the counterintelligence officer in Berlin will first of all want to know how the letter got to Huelva. It is true that letters of this kind are not supposed to be sent by post. They are usually delivered to the addressee by a special officer, but nevertheless the German counterintelligence officer will certainly ask, was he really carried by an officer? Did he look like a real officer? Therefore the dead body had to be that of an officer, and an army officer at that. Firstly, he was carrying a letter from the deputy chief of the imperial general staff to the commander of the army group, and secondly, the wartime land forces were the largest branch of the armed forces. After a while, however, we decided not to enlist him in the army. There were a number of reasons for this, but the main one had to do with the exchange of messages and reports between the respective attaches in Madrid and us in London after the body had docked on the Spanish shore. Usually telegrams and other reports came to a special section of army headquarters and were then automatically passed on to the departments concerned. As a result, a telegram reporting that a dead body had been found on the Spanish shore would be forwarded to the appropriate departments and automatically passed on to a number of people. Similarly, any other reports on the subject would get to the same people. Under the system in place at the Admiralty, I could, with the help of the head of the intelligence department, arrange so that no such transfer of documents would take place, and all information relevant to our operation would come only to me. Such an arrangement would not have caused any comment, whereas under the system in place at the War Ministry, it was quite difficult to organise the forwarding of reports to us. So we decided that the body would arrive not in the army, but in the navy, and immediately we faced new problems. 
it was not easy to make him a naval officer, while an army officer could go from London to headquarters in North Africa in a normal field uniform. A naval officer is required to wear an exit uniform, which is soon to measure and must fit the officer perfectly. So we have to find a tailor who will take the measurements off our corpse and put it on. Having imagined such a terrible picture, we immediately gave up this idea. There was another possibility to leave the officer under the control of the Admiralty, to enlist him in the Marines. This alleviated the uniform problem, but created a number of others. Firstly, whereas the army in wartime is so large that army officers would not express surprise at hearing of an unfamiliar officer in their unit, the Royal Marines are a small corps, and even in wartime their officers knew each other, or at least had heard of each other. Secondly, army officers do not carry a photo id card when travelling abroad, whereas Royal Marine officers are sure to take one with them. Meanwhile, the relatives of the deceased could not provide us with a photograph that would be suitable for the ID card. We discussed these problems for quite some time. Everyone understood perfectly well that the small number of officers in the Marine Corps threatens us with unpleasant consequences. Suppose the Spaniards send the body to Gibraltar for burial. The danger of secrecy would increase many times over. Nevertheless, given the distance between Hulva and Gibraltar, we decided to take the risk. We hoped also to deal with the difficulty caused by the photograph, but no one realized how much trouble this would be. First we tried to photograph the corpse. A total failure and people often say when criticizing a photograph I look like a dead man here. Such a remark is perhaps unjustified, but I would like to see how you manage to photograph a dead man so that he looks alive. It is impossible to describe how hopelessly dead the man looked in the photograph. T. A feverish search began for a double, or just someone who even remotely resembled our officer. It cannot be denied that our young man had an extremely peculiar appearance, but nevertheless we could not find a suitable person. All day long we walked the streets, gazing impolitely into the faces of passers-by. Finally, I decided to ask a young officer from the Naval Intelligence Department to put on a jacket and let us photograph him. The result, as might be expected, was not very good, but we unanimously decided that the resemblance was sufficient, considering how bad photographs of this kind usually are. The feeling of dissatisfaction, however, did not leave us. At one t quite unexpectedly, at one meeting where they were discussing matters unrelated to our operation, I suddenly saw opposite me a man who could be the twin of our dead man. We quickly persuaded him to withdraw, and the photo obstacle was overcome. Now what remained was the name and rank. I realized that a junior officer was unlikely to be trusted with such a letter, but to make him an officer of very high rank, we could not for several reasons. The most important of these was that the man was too young to attain high rank unless he had outstanding ability but then his fellow officers would surely have heard of him, so I decided to make him a captain with the temporary rank of major. I then sat down to the naval personnel lists. I scrutinized all the marine officer lists and found a relatively small group of captains and majors bearing the surname Martin. It seemed to me that having such a group of men was an advantage. If the death of a major Martin sparks conversation in any wardroom, there is always the hope that those present do not know all the Martins in the Marine Corps. It may have been nothing. After all, all those Martins could have been brothers, but we took an extra precaution in case of even a small risk. And there was risk in choosing a name, of course. But to the surname I added the usual name of William, and our deceased, with the knowledge of the commanding officer of the Marine Corps, who had enrolled him in the corps officer lists, became a captain with the temporary rank of Major William Martin of the Royal Marines. Finally, I took the necessary precautions in case any enquiries came to the Marine Commander's headquarters. I took out a blank identity card and rubbed it long enough on my trousers to give it the look that old documents usually had, even when carried in a wallet. I was succeeding quite well but I was concerned about the length of the artificial aging process. Suddenly a thought flashed through my mind. Major Martin had recently lost his ID card and had obtained a duplicate. I took out a new form, pasted a picture of the duplicate on it, 
filled in all the boxes and signed. The appropriate official signed that this certificate was issued on 2 February 1943 to replace the lost no. 9665 year? 9650 was the number of my own certificate. This was to reduce complications if any inquiries came in. I then attached the appropriate seals and stamps to the certificate. For reasons which I shall discuss in detail below, Major Martin was assigned to the Maritime Landing Operations Headquarters. I chose Cardiff as his place of birth without much thought. When the card was ready, I again began to age it by rubbing it against my trousers. So the basis of Major Martin's identity had been established. The finder of a dead body would easily recognize from the ID card who the deceased was. But I knew that my German friends in Huelva, Madrid or Berlin would want to know why Major Martin was traveling to North Africa. If we gave them information that answered their question, it would reinforce their belief in the authenticity of the important letter. Why is a Marine officer traveling to North Africa? What were the circumstances that led the Deputy Chief of the Imperial General Staff, upon learning of his trip, to entrust him with a personal letter? After some reflection, I found a reason that seemed plausible. Since a landing on a well-defended coast was being prepared, it was quite realistic that the command needed the help of a specialist in landing operations. Major Martin turned out to be such an expert. He must now be provided with a document to prove it. I set about drafting a letter from Lord Louis Mountbatten, Commander of Naval Landing Operations to Sir Cunningham, Commander-in-Chief of Naval Forces in the Mediterranean Theatre. This is the letter. Outgoing SR 1924-3. Naval Landing Operations Headquarters. 1A Richmond Terrace, Whitehall, Swell 31. 21 April 1943. Dear Fleet Admiral, I promised the Deputy Chief of the Imperial General Staff that Major Martin would arrange with you to send the letter in his possession to General Alexander. It is very urgent and very hot. It contains some information that not everyone in the War Ministry is allowed to know, and it cannot be sent through normal channels of communication. I hope so. You will see to it that the letter reaches you safely and without delay. In Martin, I hope you'll find the man you're looking for. At first glance, the Major seems quiet and timid, but he knows his business. He was more correct than any of us in foreseeing the events at Derepi, and he showed himself well during the tests of barges and other equipment which were carried out in Scotland. Please return him to me as soon as the operation is over. Let him bring some sardines with him. They are yours sincerely, Louis Mountbatten to Admiral Sir Cunningham of the Fleet, Commander of the Order of the Bath and the Order of Meritorious Service, Commander-in-Chief, Mediterranean Theatre, Allied Forces Headquarters, Algiers. I was pleased with this letter. It explained why Major Martin had been entrusted with an important letter rather than sending it through official channels. It also explained why Major Martin was travelling to North Africa. With the permission of the Prime Minister, he understood that if the Germans spot Sicily in case our operation failed, it would not matter much, as they were preparing to defend it against invasion anyway. I mentioned Sardinia as well, and I did so in the form of a joke. It was very heavy-handed, but to the taste of the Germans. They would certainly guess what it was about, and so they did. The hint of Sardinia played a part in our subsequent success. The letter concealed another stratagem. I could firmly expect that the Germans in Berlin would receive the important letter, or at least a copy of it, but I was not sure that they would receive more than a brief paraphrase of what we called supporting documents, and I wanted them to get Lord Mountbatten's letter in full and read the joke regarding Sardinia. It also gave an explanation of why the Major was flying to Africa and carrying an important letter. That is why I inserted the phrase which mentioned he be a no German, I thought, could resist the temptation to bring to the attention of his superiors the fact that the commander of the naval landing operations had recognized the relative failure of the Dieppe raid. Rightly or wrongly, I understood the German way of thinking, but Lord Mountbatten's letter turned out to be the only one of Major Martin's documents apart from the main one of which we found a complete copy in the German archives and which, 
as we now know, had been scrutinized by German intelligence in Berlin. The letter was retyped, signed by Lord Louis and labelled at the Naval Landing Operations Headquarters with a fictitious but quite plausible outgoing number. Finally, we gave the Major another letter in addition to his personal papers. We were well aware that the officer would probably have put two normal-sized envelopes in his pocket or in a suitcase with his belongings, even though one of the letters was secret. If Major Martin had done so, we would have had no absolute guarantee that the Spaniards would notice the letters before they handed the body over to the consulate, and we didn't want the German agent in Huelva to berate his Spanish servants for not searching the body. So there must be a reason why Major Martin would put the letters in the briefcase. I had to create one. It happened that the official brochure on the actions of our commandos, written by Hilary Sanders, simultaneously prepared for printing in England and in the United States. It was only natural. We decided, if Lord Louis Mountbatten would ask General Eisenhower to write a foreword to it, so we drafted a letter making this request. It was accompanied by facts of the pamphlet and photographs. We took the opportunity to give another little indication in the letter that Major Martin was a very responsible officer. I enclose this letter. Outgoing SRH 1989-T3. Naval Landing Operations Headquarters. 1A, Richmond Terrace, Whitehall, U31. 22 April 1943. Dear General, I am sending you two copies of faceted brochures on the activities of my commandos. I am also enclosing copies of the photographs to be included in this brochure. Say the pamphlet is written by Hilary St. W. Saunders, author of the Battle of England, Bomber Aviation, and other publications which have been very successful both in our country and yours. The edition to be published in the States already has pre-orders for nearly 1.5 million copies and I am aware that the American authorities will distribute the book widely to the U.S. Army. I have also learned from the British Information Bureau in Washington that they would be pleased to receive a foreword written by you and use it in the publicity of the pamphlet, and that they have already asked you for it through Washington. The grunts I am sending with my staff officer Major W. Martin of the Marine Corps. I need not say what an honor you will do us all by writing the foreword. I am well aware what a big ask it is now that you are busy with much more important matters, but I hope you will take a few minutes to preface the booklet with an expression of your approval. It will help to convey to the people of the United States and Great Britain the message of our cooperation. We are watching your brilliant progress with admiration and pleasure, and we all long to be with you. Major Martin has my full confidence, and you are free to speak to him on this and all other matters. Yours sincerely, Louis Mountbatten, General Dwight Eisenhower, Allied Forces Headquarters, Algeria. Lord Louis signed the letter and we put it in a special packet along with the enclosure. Now the fact that Major Martin used a briefcase for the documents seemed quite justified. But that was not all. We had found an excuse to present the Spaniards with the official papers in such a way as to avoid the consequences of their possible carelessness in examining the body, and we had gained added confidence that they would find our papers. But had we foreseen everything, just when we were congratulating ourselves on our remarkable finds, we had a sudden apprehension. Would the body and the briefcase turn up in Huelva at the same time? Would we put the handle of the briefcase in Major Martin's hand? But the risk was too great. The hand might unclench and the sea would carry the briefcase away. The solution we could find we did not like, for it was the only detail in our whole plan that looked deliberate. We were forced to settle on the following solution. The officer carrying important papers attached a chain to the briefcase, as bank clerks use, and hid it in his sleeve so that no one could snatch it out of his hands. This seemed to us a very unnatural way out for we knew that English officers never used chains, but we had to rely on the fact that our opponents in Berlin would swallow it. After all, they could not be sure that an English officer would under no circumstances use a chain in an endeavour to keep his briefcase safe. So we took the risk of resorting to the chain, as may be seen from the instructions to Lieutenant Jewell, 
We decided that Major Martin would not hold his briefcase in his hand during his long flight, and that it was reasonable for his safety to fasten the briefcase to the chain and fasten it to the waistband of his overcoat for convenience. But aren't we worrying too much? On the other hand, the Germans in Berlin might get suspicious about it if they were informed about the chain. I will not go ahead and say one thing. We were lucky because this detail was not checked by the Germans. Still, I would very much like to know whether the risk was justified. We believed that the Spaniards would report this important fact accurately, and the Germans would not risk, because of a chain tubeous stroke in a very convincing picture, refusing to recognize all the documents as authentic. We shall never know whether we were right in our fears, but perhaps it is better for us. Finally, since Major Martin was serving in the headquarters of the Maritime Landing Operations, we gave him a special pass. And here we felt that we were in danger of making Major Martin too much of a paragon of all virtues, and that he, like all men, must have weaknesses or faults in addition to the loss of his identity card. Next the reader will see how we have built up his character. In our interpretation, he is somewhat careless in his personal affairs, but a very capable officer. However, we did not want to completely separate his personal qualities from his service qualities. Besides, as the reader will learn in the next chapter, an event had occurred in Major Martin's life which might well have banished from his thoughts such trifles as the renewal of a pass. So at our will he was negligent, as we all have sinned from time to time, in not taking care to renew his pass. The pass we gave him expired on 31 March 1943. It would not surprise the Germans, nor would it surprise us. That Major Martin did not renew his pass before his departure in the third or fourth week of April. It was now necessary to supply Major Martin with uniforms. One of us, a man of about the same height and build as our Major, got a suitable field uniform, and we decorated it with Marine Corps stripes, a commando badge and a Major's crown. We also found an old overcoat to which we attached the same insignia, having previously pierced the epaulets in three places to indicate their owner's recent captaincy. We took out our boots and winding gear, as well as our top shirt and under... They were not new, and we spoilt the tags of the various laundries, and then gave them all to one laundry to have the same tags put on the underwear. We bought the shirt in a military shop and stuffed the wrinkled receipt into the overcoat pocket. This is where we made a really serious blunder. The officer who bought the shirt at our request had not served in the Navy and acted from the point of view of a career sailor, completely incomprehensible. He paid in cash. However, it was difficult for him to do otherwise, since Bill Martin did not have an account with the shop. We paid no attention to this circumstance, and it was not until the body was already in Spain that it suddenly dawned on me that no naval officer much less one from whom a debt was insistently demanded, would ever pay in cash. So that I consoled myself with the thought that we had to deceive the Germans, and they could not know how willingly this long-suffering firm was to make concessions to the officers. But still we made a mistake, and here our instincts betrayed us. So the body of the man who wasn't there became the body of Major Martin of the Marines and whoever found the body would have enough information about who this man was and why he was where he was found. But so far, it was only the body of an officer. We had yet to furnish the Major with personal effects and human character. For us, Major Martin had long since become a real person. But this feeling, and as fully as possible, had to be shared with us by those who would have to examine the body and the documents in the briefcase. The fewer doubts they had the better the chances of success of the whole operation. I was quite sure that the Germans would pay attention to the most insignificant details and try to find omissions in Major Martin's makeup in order to be sure of the authenticity of the whole story and therefore of the documents that would fall into their hands. And I wasn't wrong. As we learned later, the Germans even paid attention to the date on the stubs of the two theatre tickets found in Major Martin's pocket. We talked about Major Martin all the time, and it was as if we were talking over a friend behind his back. In truth, we sometimes really felt that Martin existed, and that we had known him for a long time. Nevertheless, 
we endeavoured to make his character and inclination such as would satisfy your purposes. As I have said, we have decided that Major Martin is a brilliant officer who enjoys the confidence of his superiors. The lapses in his service which he had made were very ordinary. He had lost his identity card and had not renewed his headquarters pass in time. On this we built character, confirming it with papers that would end up in the Major's pockets. It was the only way to let the Germans know what kind of man Martin was. He didn't mind having a good time once in a while, and so he might have an invitation to a nightclub lying around. Hence, quite reasonably, a letter from the bank saying that the Major had overdrawn his credit, coming to London. He may have stayed at an army club, and so he must have a bill for his accommodation there. So bit by bit the image of Major Martin was drawn out more and more clearly but how to make him a truly living person. The only way at our disposal was to put into Martin's pockets letters from which some details of his private life might be learnt. On the other hand, stop any passerby on the street and examine his pockets. There are hardly any letters about any serious matters in them, considering the problem from this point of view. We came to the conclusion that a man keeps letters with him, giving a vivid idea of his appearance only after betrothal, when he makes plans for future family life, so we decided to betroth Bill before he left for Africa. So in late March, Major Martin met a pretty girl named Pam and almost immediately got engaged to her. Oh, those wartime romances. She gave him a photograph of herself amateur, of course, and he gave her an engagement ring. He had two letters from her, one written during a country trip and one written in the office when the owner was out on business extremely excited. The groom had hinted to her that he was being sent somewhere abroad. He had also a bill for an engagement ring unpaid, of course, for his credit at the bank was exhausted. And finally, the major's father, with his old-fashioned views on life, disapproved of wartime weddings and insisted that his son should make a will immediately, if he had finally decided to take such a foolish and imprudent step. We realized that it would be impossible to characterize Major Martin more fully, by means of a few letters, but the letters must appear to be genuine, and someone must have written them. Of course we could have written them ourselves. Many of us knew, and all too well, what a letter from the bank about an overdraft looks like, and some of us had received love letters and had managed to make a will, but I decided it was better to rely on the experts to avoid mistakes. Some things settled very easily. For example, one of us got an invitation to the cabaret club. They didn't put a surname on the ticket, and the nightclub was secured. Getting a letter of overdraft was not difficult either. Through another of our comrades who had connections at the main office of Lloyd's Bank, we obtained a letter from there, dated 14 April, addressed to Major Martin, claiming an overdraft of Pierce and Nine. I was later asked whether a letter regarding such a comparatively small sum is always signed by the chief executive of the bank. I wondered about this myself, as I know from bitter experience that such letters are usually signed by the branch manager. When I expressed my concern about this, I was assured that the letter might come from the main office, although as a rule such letters are signed by the branch manager. The Germans, we hoped, were not so detailed in the matter of overdrafts, and after all, even if the amount was small, Major Martin's father was quite obviously a man of considerable means. A letter from Lloyd's Bank, signed by Mr. Whitley Jones, Lloyd's Bank Limited, Head Office, London VC3, 14 April 1943, Spale, to Major W. Martin of the Marine Corps, Army and Navy Club, Pull Mall, London CS We One. Dear Sir, it has come to my attention that, despite repeated communications to you, the excess of your credit, amounting to £79.12 shillings 2 pence, is still not covered. Circumstances compel me to inform you that if this amount plus 4% is not paid by you, we shall have to take the necessary steps to protect our interests. Your sincere Whitley Jones principal superintendent. We arranged that a letter from the bank, which should have been sent to Major Martin at the Navy Club, was allegedly misdirected to the Army and Navy Club at Pole, Mall, where the porter wrote on the envelope, 
no record at this address, and he added, possibly the Navy Club 94 Piccadilly. From our point of view, this inscription proved the authenticity of the letter very strongly, so we decided that Major Martin would keep it in the envelope. One of us contacted the Navy Club, and from there we received an invoice marked 24 April, indicating that Major Martin, a member of the club, was staying there from 18 to 23 April inclusive. This indicated that Martin was still in London on the 24th of April. Just as comparatively easily we got the bill for the wedding ring, I chose the firm of S.J. Phillips in Bond Street, which had international connections in the jewellery trade. There would probably be accounts of this firm in Germany, I thought, and a comparison with them would convince our friends of the genuineness of Major Martin's account. The invoice was dated the 19th of April, but it showed that the ring had been bought on the 15th. Of course, we had difficulty in obtaining these and other documents, for we could not say for what purpose we needed them. If you simply ask for such documents and say that they are needed for secret purposes, it is bound to provoke talk. On the other hand, if you come up with a plausible reason, the people you have to contact can be relied upon. So in my version, someone is interested in officers who are temporarily short of money. We, they say, need documents that would indicate a lack of money, and that can be left in one officer's room where a suspicious person will see them. Then we could observe his behavior. To everyone, my story seemed quite real. We were willingly helped and no one let us down. Now that all the documents were ready, we needed to find the heroine. First of all, we needed a photograph of Pam, Major Martin's fiancé. We asked the most attractive girls from various departments of the Admiralty to lend us their photos ostensibly to make an identification of one woman. This is done by mixing a large number of photographs of completely innocent people with two or three photographs of a suspect person, so that the witness can select from them the photograph of the person in question. The girls gave us a few photos each, and we put together a pretty solid collection. We chose one of them and returned the rest a week later. The girl, owner of the photo, had access to top-secret documents, and we could tell her that we wanted to use her photo as a snapshot of a fictitious bride in an operation we were running. She gave her consent. Now came the question of the letters. Neither of us were eager to write love letters. After all, we didn't have a woman's perspective on love. Asking a woman we knew to write a first-rate love song was a sensitive matter, so we asked a girl who worked in one of our institutions to persuade one of her mates to do it. She agreed, but never gave us the name of the one who had written two splendid letters to Major Martin. I decided that the first letter would be written on my brother-in-law's letter paper, for, in my opinion, no German could resist the purely English address which stood there. Manor House of Bound St. George's, Marlborough, Wiltshire. This is the letter, dated Sunday, 18 April. Manor House, Ogborns George, Marlborough, Wiltshire. 242 Ogborns George. Sunday, the 18th. I think, dear, seeing people like you off to the railway station is one of the nastiest things to do. The departing train leaves such a void in the soul that it's hopeless to try to fill it with all those things that gave you pleasure five weeks ago, that marvellous golden day we spent together. Oh, I know it's been said before, but if only time could sometimes stop for a moment, me. But don't pull yourself together, Pam, and don't be daft. I feel a little better about your letter, but I'll hold my nose if you don't stop talking about me like that. I'm not like that at all, and I'm afraid you'll see it soon enough. So here I am here on Sunday, in this blessed place. Both Mama and Jane are very nice and understanding, and I can't tell you how homesick I am, and I'm looking forward to Monday so I can get back to my work and forget myself a little. What a stupid waste of time. Bill, honey, write me as soon as you get settled and your plans are more definite, and please don't let them send you off somewhere blue, as they tend to do now, now that we've found each other in this big world. I don't think I could bear it. I love you with all my heart. Churn. She wrote the second letter on plain stationery. At first the handwriting was quite clear, then suddenly it changed to hurried scribbles. The boss had returned, she had to finish the sh This is the letter. Surface. Wednesday, the 21st. 
The bloodhound left her doghouse for half an hour, and here I am again writing you nonsense. I got your letter this morning as I was running out of the house, late as usual. What a divine letter. But why such a dark implication that you might be sent away? Of course I'll keep it a secret. I don't share what you tell me with anyone. You're being sent abroad, aren't you? I don't want that. I don't want you to tell them that for me. Honey, why did we meet during the war? It's ridiculous. If the war was over, we'd be almost married by now, and we'd be out shopping together, picking out curtains and so on, and I wouldn't be sitting in this gloomy office typing up idiotic minutes all day. I know it's a useless job that doesn't bring the end of the war any nearer. Dear Bill, I like my ring so much. It's a scandalous waste. Though you know I adore diamonds, I just can't take my eyes off it. I'm going to some boring dance tonight with Jack and Hazel. I think they invited some other man. You know how their mates always turn out? He's bound to have an Adam's apple protruding and a shiny bolt top. It's ungrateful of me to say that, but that's not the point. You know that, don't you? Look, darling, I'm free next Sunday and Monday for Easter. I'll go to mine, of course. Please come too if you can. And if you can't leave London, I'll come to you and we'll have a great evening. Yes, by the way, Aunt Marion said to bring you to dinner the next time I'm at her place, but that can be postponed, can't it? Here comes the bloodhound. Lots of love and a kiss. Pam. We counted ourselves lucky with the love letters. Major Martin's father was played by a young officer who made a brilliant tour de force. Sons the letter of the 13th of April and its appendix were so characteristic of the person of old times that it seemed simply inconceivable to invent them. No one but a man of the old school could have written like that. Here is that letter and the appendix. Tell no. 98. Black Lion Inn. Mould, North Wales. 13 April 1943. My dear William, I cannot say that this hotel is as comfortable now as it was in pre-war times. However, I am staying here because it is the only opportunity I have of not imposing myself once more on your aunt, whose house, owing to the reduction in the number of servants and strict economy of fuel illy I recognize this as necessary in war team, has become almost uninhabitable at least for a person of my age. I intend to be in London on the 20th and 21st of April, when I shall doubtless have an opportunity of meeting you. I enclose a copy of a letter I wrote to Gortkin at the office of the firm of McKenna, comments about your affairs. As you will see, I have invited him to breakfast with me at the Carlton, which I know is still open, at a quarter to one o'clock on Wednesday, the 21st of April, and I shall be very glad if you find it possible to join us. We will not, however, postpone breakfast on your account, so I hope you will, if you can come, endeavour to be punctual. Your cousin Priscilla asked me to give you her regards. She has grown up to be a sensible girl, though I cannot say that her work in the Volunteer Agricultural Army has had a favourable effect on her looks. I'm afraid she's like her relatives on her father's side in that respect. Your loving father. Shepherds. Tell. 98. The Black Lion Inn. Mould, North Wales. 10 April. My dear Gutkin, I have considered your latest proposal regarding the monetary settlements I am about to make in connection with William's wedding. The terms of the marriage contract you have outlined seem to me quite reasonable, except for one point, as in this case the wife's family are not contributing their share. I think it is improper for William's wife to retain for life, after his death, a right to the capital which I am providing for. I would only agree to this if there are children as a result of the marriage. I would therefore ask you to rewrite the draft prenuptial agreement to ensure that if William has children, the income from the capital is paid to the wife only, until she remarries or the children reach adulthood. Thereafter the capital passes to the children. I shall come to London on the 20th of April. I should be very glad if you would agree to breakfast with me at Carton's at a quarter to one o'clock on Wednesday the 21st. If you bring a new draft with you, we can study it after breakfast. I have written to William and hope he will join us. Yours sincerely, T.G. Martin. A.A.S. Gotkin S. Cook. McKenna Achiel City. 14. Waterloo Place. 
London SW. We chose the Black Lion Hotel in Mould, not only because of its purely English address, which in itself was very convincing. We also took into account that Major Martin was born in Cardiff. I hope the proprietors of the hotel will forgive us for using their letter paper and questioning the facilities for which the Black Lion is justly famous. And finally I asked my mate, a clerk of the firm, to put the finishing touches on the picture by letter on the letter paper of the firm of McKenna A. Kodeg. McKenna H. E. Company, Attorneys at Law. Outgoing Mikel Tedge. 14. Waterloo Place, London, W1. 19 April 1943. Dear Sir, We thank you for your letter of yesterday in which you returned the draft of your will approved. We will include a clause about a gift of PIS 50 to your vestry. Mr. Goutkin will hand you a clean copy when he meets you at breakfast on the 21st of this month so that you can sign it. Say to tax inspector has asked us for details of your salary for 1941-1942 to ascertain the amount of allowance you should receive for the current year. We have found that we do not have this information and would therefore be grateful if you would provide it to us. Yours sincerely, McKenna H.E. Company. To Major W. Martin. Naval Club. 94 Piccadilly. London 31. When we read in succession all these documents, they caused us to visualize a living person. We felt that more could not be done with the few papers that logically could be found in the pockets of a dead officer. We took some precautions before handing these letters to Major Martin. All the letters except the love letters I carried in my pockets for several days, so that they would have the right appearance. The love letters were more difficult to deal with especially the one written on very thin paper. The Major, of course, read them and reread them, and they could not look as if he had recently received them. One of our officers suggested just crumpling them up and straightening them out. But if a piece of paper is crumpled, no amount of smoothing will hide the fact that it has been crumpled. Would Bill Martin have crumpled those letters? I did what he would do. I read them over and over again and folded them neatly, only unlike him. I regularly rubbed them on my trap, so we made careful preparations for the operation, though it had not yet been finally approved. Having studied Sir Archibald Nye's letter, the chiefs of staff had agreed in principle to the operation. Permission was now required to carry it out. At this stage a clash of interests was inevitable. The chiefs of staff naturally did not want to be bound by the information contained in the letter for our strategic plan could change as it had done many times. On the other hand, the letter had to reach Spain by the beginning of May if the operation was to have any effect. German intelligence, when it received this information, would need time to ascertain its authenticity, evaluate it, and pass its conclusions to headquarters. The latter needs time to redeploy troops to the area of our supposed landing. In addition, if we wanted to force the Germans to stop work on the fortification of Sicily, it was not worth waiting until the construction of defences will be completed. The chiefs of staff recognised the validity of our arguments and agreed to carry out the operation, provided it was approved by the Prime Minister, who was informed of our plan through generalism. When the Prime Minister was told that if the operation failed there was a risk of giving away our intention to land in Sicily, he remarked, it hardly matters. Only a fool could fail to realize that we are targeting Sicily. We felt it was our duty to inform also that the operation might fail, because the body might be discovered by Spaniards not connected with the Germans. Then the papers would return to us intact. To this the Prime Minister smiled and said, Well, we can always try again. So, we got the good, though, on the condition that our plan will be brought to the attention of General Eisenhower, if he had any objections, or if the strategic intentions of the Allies changed before the body was lowered into the sea. The operation would have to be cancelled in the manner indicated in paragraph 8 of the order to Lieutenant Jewell. We were now to proceed to the least pleasant part of the preparation of the operation, to prepare the body for its mission. This work did not arouse our enthusiasm. Although we knew what a great service our major would render to the country of this we had no doubt, we were loath to disturb his peace. Martin had become a truly living person to us. 
we knew him as only close friends unknown. After all, not everyone is allowed to read such tender letters from their sweetheart and intimate letters from their father. It seemed to us as if we had known Bill Martin since childhood, and were now personally involved in the development of his affair with Pam and all his financial troubles. We could safely claim to know him better than most fathers know their sons. In creating the living Martin, we studied his every thought and tried to anticipate the Major's reaction to any event that might occur in his life. 